find tonight very, very difficult. Forgive me if I break. I've broken many, many times. The one thing that always saved me is not how many times I broke, but how many times I got back up off the floor. I'm struggling today because of the situation I'm still in. Uh, it's a situation that started when I was 14 years old. I was a young boy from an extremely dysfunctional family. Uh, my father was a violent alcoholic. Uh, there was physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse in the household. And of course, I, uh, I used to spend most of my time outside the house because of that. And uh, at the same time, of course, the only other people that were staying out late at night were other young boys who were actually getting into trouble. And so I started getting into trouble with them. And it ended up basically in me uh, setting fire to my own school, uh, for which I was sent to an approved school for. Um, I was there for some 18 months and about to be released uh, uh, when the police came to question me about this offence. I was the fourth person to be arrested for this offence. Uh, the one before me was my older brother. Uh, they basically kidnapped my older brother off the street and uh, interrogated him until he actually confessed to the crime at midnight one night. Uh, he retracted his confession when uh, uh, my mother went down to see him and uh, because they had no other evidence against him he was released. But before he was released he was told it doesn't matter which one we get, we'll get one of you. And then they came for me. I was quite a disturbed child, very, very difficult to get through to, very, very withdrawn and closed in within myself. I basically, I used to live within my own head because it was the only safe place I ever knew. Home wasn't a safe place. The approval school I was at wasn't a safe place. The only place I could actually survive was actually within my own head. And I was pretty much an easy target for the police, uh, pretty much because of my background and how I was at that time. I was interviewed some five times by the police. Uh, the last interview, uh, uh, basically I ended up confessing to a crime. Uh, the police helped me write a statement, which actually at the time I was actually quite grateful to them for because they were helping me actually stop what was going on the interrogation which I don't know how to describe it when you're in that room on your own the only thing you want to do is to get out to get out of that room to stop what is going on and they were actually being friendly towards me now instead of threatening me threatening to hit me threatening me with, they actually threatened me with three further attempted murders uh, I didn't know that they couldn't actually charge me with them. I was just a scared young kid. Because I wrote a confession, uh, I had a pre-trial hearing when I uh, went up to court to decide whether the evidence was admissible. There was another person in the room at the time. It was one of the headmasters from the approved school, basically one of my jailers. And he sat there throughout the whole time and never said anything until right at the end when he actually told me to give it up and tell them the truth. And that's basically when I broke. And I told them basically anything they wanted to know. And they were actually uh, uh, putting questions to me. And when I gave them an answer, they would put the question to me again in a different way or suggest things to me. For example, they were asking me, there were some boards which the young boy was buried under. And they asked me how big they were. So I just made a measurement on the table. And they said, are you sure it wasn't bigger than that? So I made another measurement on the table. And they said, are you sure it's not bigger than that? So I made another measurement on the table. And they said, yeah, that's about right. And that's what they wrote down. They didn't write down that they'd asked me three or four times until I actually got it right. And of course, the words were out of my own mouth. I was saying the boards were this big or this big. What they don't actually say in court is how they came to that conclusion. The housemaster who was actually in the room at the time during the interrogation stood up in court and said he didn't think there was anything wrong. Uh, he did later come back at my appeal and retract that, uh, uh, which 
I was going to say fair play to him, but fuck him. It's not fair play to him. I had to wait 25 years for him to actually tell the fucking truth. So I know it's not fair play to him, fuck him. And we had to track him down. And apparently when he was tracked down by uh, uh, Channel 4's Trial and Error TV program, <laughs> and it was actually a dark, windy, stormy night, and he was living on a caravan site in South Wales, and when he heard the knock on the door, he opened the door, and without actually asking who it was, he said, I've been expecting you. Who was he expecting? I mean, previous to that, he had been contacted several times during my appeals and uh, uh, from Channel, uh, Channel 4's trial and error for further evidence, but of course he wasn't actually prepared to, well, basically put himself in the dock. I was convicted on the strength of the statement that I wrote for the police and I was sentenced to life detention and pretty much I was sent from there straight to what I can only call gladiator school. Uh, I was sent to a juvenile facility where I was the youngest and pretty much the smallest person in there and I became a target for every single person in that prison and not only a target, I was a free target because now I was one thing and one thing only. I was a nonce. Nothing more, nothing less. Nothing, never be anything else. You were just a nonce. You were less than, you were less than shit on somebody's shoe. And anybody could do anything to you. The first time I was ever put on adjudication when I was in prison was when I actually refused a direct order from a prison officer. In them days it was run quite along uh, uh, military lines of prisons and most of the staff were ex-military and uh, I was actually uh, uh, ordered to mop my own blood up off the floor after two other inmates had attacked me in front of a prison officer and that prison officer ordered me to mop my own blood up off the floor and I refused and I was placed on report for it I was found guilty of it and I was punished for it I was given 14 days cellular confinement and that's how I learned pretty much how my life was going to be from then on and that pretty much was how my life was from then on. I was a really, really screwed up kid. Could barely read and write at the time. And of course, I was now at the mercy of what can only cause a bunch of hyenas. I was prey, nothing more. And I was pretty much beaten up on a daily, day, uh, on a daily basis. <coughs> If I went down to a, a, a dining hall, as in any other prison, if I would walk in the dining hall, there'd be this many people in the dining hall. You'd go up to the counter, and one of the screws would go, feeding the nonce. And every single person in that room would go silent and turn around and look. Because they wanted to know who they were going to get. Because you were next on the fucking list. And it might be just because somebody was a bully. It might be because somebody had a bee in their bonnet about you being a nonce and your offence. I.e. being an armed robber is better than being a nonce. In their eyes. <clears throat> it's a screwed up world. It's a criminal world. <coughs> and pretty much, not everybody, not everybody in prison is a bad person. Some people are quite good people. They just happen to be in prison for bad things. But pretty much the vast, vast majority of them are in there for one reason, one reason only. Because they have preyed on somebody else in some way, shape or form. And that's what they did to me for 25 years. They preyed on me. And they were allowed to. I didn't know how to fight back. Couldn't fight my way out of a fucking wet paper bag to tell you the truth. But I soon fucking learned. And I learned the hard way. I was stabbed seven times when I was in prison. Once I was stabbed three times on a lock-up period, and a lock-up period is during the dinner hour when the uh, prison staff have their, uh, go for their dinner, and usually it's the, the screws tea boys and people like that who are left unlocked. My door was unlocked, and three people in balaclavas with blades piled into my cell. I managed to fight them out of the cell and wedge the door shut, but I was stabbed three times, uh, twice in the neck. They weren't there to hurt me, they were there to fucking kill me. I used to target screws myself. As far as I was concerned, they were the enemy. Everybody was my enemy. I had no allies in prison. There was no other innocent miscarriages of justice in my prison. I was a YP. Uh, uh, anybody else that was sort of becoming known 
uh, were adults and in the dispersal system. I was in the juvenile system, which pretty much meant they could do anything they wanted to me. At the age of 15, I was fighting 21 and 22 year olds, three, four and five handed, sometimes six, eight and ten handed, where they'd pile into the showers and just steam into you and kick fuck out of you. So anytime you go for a shower, never mind your soap and your shampoo, take a fucking blade with you, because you're going to need it. Doesn't matter where it is, a bit of razor blade, a toothbrush, toothbrush sharpened up on the windowsill outside, a bit of metal, doesn't matter, anything cause as much fucking damage as you can before they do you because that's the only thing they fucking understand and over time I suppose it was the only thing I began to understand as well it was my life and I was told time and time and time and time again that I was mentally ill my crime was so horrific I blanked it out but I had actually committed the crime these were adults these were psychologists psychiatrists, prison governors, these were people I looked to for help, these are people I looked to to be some sort of sanity in all this fucking madness. They, they, they were the instigators, they were the insti instigators. For years and years and years they had me convinced I was mad, that I didn't know my own mind, that I was sick, that I had committed a crime and couldn't actually remember it. Because these were the people that I was, I suppose, not only just scared of, but I didn't know anything else. These were the only people who knew anything. I, I knew jack shit. I was a young boy, locked up in a really, really bad place. From juvenile prison, they sent me to Blunderston as an uh, adult facility. Uh, it wasn't a progressive move. It was just basically somewhere where I pretty much discovered drugs, uh, somewhere where I actually discovered heroin, uh, and I became a full-blown heroin addict very, very quickly, uh, and started selling it, basically to keep my own habit going, selling it or smuggling it, robbing drug dealers, whatever it may be, just to get the gear, wait for somebody to come off a visit, drag them in the cell, and stick a knife at their throat, and say, I will get your parcel out, or I'll fucking get it out for you, just for the brown and it pretty much took over my life and over my world at Blunderstone for the next three to four years. At the same time, I'd never really had a problem actually talking to the people who actually incarcerated me and trying to talk to them about what was going on with me, what was going on in my world, what was going on in my head. But nobody wanted to know. The only thing they actually wanted to know was why I'd committed this crime and how I committed this crime, what led to it, what led up to it, what I actually did, and uh, the follow-on to that. And nobody would ever, ever listen or ask any other question or anything else. <coughs> there were a few people, I suppose, within the prison system who actually looked at me and decided that it was, it was actually worth looking at who this person was and what this person was about but they were a very very few few shining lights in a very very dark place and any time anyone ever did try to help me in any kind of positive way they were pretty much censored by their own bosses nobody was actually trying to help me in any other way shape or form other than the odd one or two people so I was pretty much a, a, a at a loss, lost at sea, if you, you know, for want of a better word, because I had no idea what to do, how to go about it, where to go, who to speak to. My own lawyers had disappeared as soon as my uh, uh, appeal was finished, didn't want to know, didn't reply to me anymore, just not interested. But where do you go? In them days, there was no days, uh, there was no information packs in prison where you're actually informed of what the rules or regulations are. I used to find out about the rules and regulations as they were used to batter me into submission. And they were used to batter me into submission because that's exactly what the object of the exercise was, was to break you over and over again until they got their own way. And like I say, I did. I, I broke many, 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 many times. And I, I don't really have a problem with that. 
because I've seen bigger fucking men than me break down lots of times but I've always got back up because the one thing I actually found out is that no matter what they said about me no matter what they said to me no matter what they tried to make me believe they couldn't change one thing they couldn't change what had happened you can't change the past you can't change history you can rewrite history but once that second the last second has just gone it's not reclaimable what was done then is done then and once I learned that truth I knew I was actually unbeatable I wasn't invulnerable but I was unbeatable whether they killed me dead on the spot in the next second it didn't matter they still could not beat me because they couldn't change the circumstances of that day I was sitting at home watching the TV with four other people that doesn't change it doesn't change then it doesn't change now and nobody's ever actually denied that nobody has ever denied I was sitting in that room with four people with those four people watching TV the fact is they still convicted me because they were members of my family and of course they would say that wouldn't they as they said in court there was forensic evidence in this case uh, unfortunately it was all accidentally destroyed before my trial and this was passed off at my trial with the comment fortunately for Mr Blackburn all the forensic evidence was destroyed accidentally before the trial and that was the sum total of evidence concerning uh, 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 forensics and it was passed off on that it wasn't challenged by anyone nobody seemed that interested to tell you the truth the only person who actually seemed interested in what was going on was actually me my own lawyers actually came up and gave a different defence from what I was giving <laughs> believe it or not but uh, I actually met my QC on the day of the trial I had no idea who he was I had no idea what a QC was none whatsoever actually talking about QCs Rudy Narayan's having a, a blue plaque put up in Brixton this evening he was uh, one of the founders of the Society of Black Lawyers and I was trying to be there tonight but I've got to be here with you guys well, I wanted to be here with you guys <laughs> they did try to progress me later on uh, they moved me to a category C prison uh, which was a lowering in uh, uh, my security classification and uh, I did start making some progress while I was there I was actually allowed to go outside the prison on trips, days out and things like that um, this lasted for maybe six to eight months and I was then visited by a suit from the Home Office I have no idea who he was to this day and I was interviewed in the Governor's Office and I was asked to drop my case, uh, 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 fighting my case and I was told that I would be in a, an open prison within 12 to 18 months and I didn't know how else to answer other than to tell him to go fuck himself and basically he just looked at me and said no fuck you and they did they shipped me out to Durham they tried to uh, ship me out on a medical move which was basically they were trying now trying to uh, uh, move me into uh, a psychiatric hospital luckily the psychiatrist at, uh, at Durham prison a consultant psychiatrist who was from outside the prison uh, basically interviewed me and basically thought it was absolutely ridiculous idea he thought I was deserved he thought I was having some extreme difficulties but in no way was I mentally disturbed which for me was actually a revelation because for all that time I had actually thought I was disturbed I had thought there was something wrong with me why I'd become what I'd become which was pretty much I'd become a convict through and through uh, because of that I was actually moved uh, uh, backwards pretty much after uh, DLPs were introduced I was moved back into the dispersal system uh, I've never really been in the dispersal system before there was no <coughs> need I was a juvenile and uh, uh, from then on I was being told that unless I actually started admitting uh, 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 what I'd actually done and taking part in their new offending behaviour courses that I would die in prison I pretty much accepted that I accepted I was going to die in prison and for most of the time I felt the sooner the better 
most of the time now I still feel the sooner the better uh, dispersal for me was pretty much like going home I guess uh, going into a long term prison was actually quite quite an education I was now with a lot of IRA prisoners a lot of long term lifers some major major criminals and quite a few other innocent miscarriages of justice <laughs> others miscarriages of justice I'd, I'd never actually met in prison before and now I started meeting them and started learning how to fight but how to fight properly how to fight with my gob instead of my fist or with a blade uh, I was never that articulate the, I think probably the longest word that ever came out of my mouth before that was fuck off you bastard <laughs> didn't understand that it was actually worthwhile fighting them at their own game because at the end of the day if they're trying to uh, say to me you're a sex offender and you must take part in a sex offender treatment program the only way you've actually got to fight in them is uh, in many ways is to actually uh, take their own case and rip it apart and throw it back in their face just standing there and telling them to fuck off and fight them well they can deal that with all day they'll just send ten screws with mufti gear on through your door which they've done many a time Mufti gear actually is, is, uh, 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 is quite a nice term. It's actually uh, minimum use of force, tactical intervention or something like that, which basically means somebody in full body armour, a crash helmet, a big shield and a big fucking stick. What the minimum use of force is, I'll never know, because the first thing they did was put you up against the wall and batter you fucking senseless. The only way to defeat that and to get away from, well, not get away from it, because you're always going to get it, is wait 6 months, 12 months, 18 months, 2 years, 5 years. I once waited 14 years until I spotted someone again. And when I spotted him again, I fucking had him. And I fucking had him big time. I just tipped a bucket of shit over his head. It wasn't going to kill him, he wasn't going to die from it. But every time I ever saw him after that, it was just... You smell shit. He knew exactly what I fucking meant. They dragged me feet first down the block. They bounced my fucking head off every fucking stairwell, door corner, anything else they could on the way down. Then they battered the fuck out of me, stripped me naked and left me in a strip cell for three weeks, which is basically an empty room with a concrete bed and a, a, a cardboard piss pot. And uh, basically they just come in, give you your dinner, spit in it, piss in your cup of tea and leave it behind. You're going to do, you're going to starve to death, you're going to die first. You not, you drink it, you eat it. You don't have any choice. You're in a concrete room, where else are you going to go? Where else are you going to eat? You ain't going to the canteen. You're not going to the canteen anyway, because they never used to give me any fucking wages, because I wouldn't work. You know, so I had no people outside sending me money in. I had no people outside wondering how I was. I had no people outside campaigning for me. I was on my own. I started getting some interest when... Uh, um, trial and error started getting involved in my case and that came about after there was a um, uh, there was a campaign by the uh, uh, civil liberties uh, uh, group who had a, a news uh, um, news story in the Guardian and there was 112 cases featured and my case was one of them and on the back of that I had a lawyer volunteer to help me and I got Channel, Channel 4's trial and error interested in investigating my case and they did investigate my case they went back and interviewed everyone they went back through all the evidence and a lot of the evidence that they actually dug up did actually form the central part of my appeal many 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 years later on they always believed that all I ever actually needed was to actually get my case back into court and to get my case heard getting yourself back into court was one of the hardest things um, initially I went up to the Home Secretary asking for a new appeal which was refused then we gathered new evidence which was um, having the police notes uh, uh, forensically tested which uh, showed the notes were not contem contemporaneous um, the statement I'd written including and involved a hell of a lot of language that wasn't my own and uh, uh, was described by one expert as typical police language and this formed the basis of my later appeal. I don't know really how to describe <coughs> 25 years in prison. 
to me, even now, it doesn't seem like it was a second ago. I've been out of prison now seven years. It's been five years since I won my appeal. It feels like yesterday. It doesn't feel like one single day has gone by since I was in that room with those police officers. It doesn't feel as if one single day has gone by when I don't feel the rage welling up inside me and the anger eating away at me because of what they did for themselves, not for anybody else. They just wanted to clear a case up. They didn't give a fuck who they got. They just wanted a body. They got a body. And for 25 years, that's all I was. I was a body. I actually fought the prison system on two different levels. I fought them on their own level, i.e. they wanted to rehabilitate me. How the fuck they were going to do that, I never knew. Uh, they could have rehabilitated me from being uh, an out-and-out -out convict, which I'd become, to being a normal member of society again. They weren't fucking interested in that. They just want you to jump through the hoops, to take part in their sex offender training programs, which I never ever did, and I never ever would. Because of course, one of the uh, 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 first and foremost to be on one of those courses, you actually have to admit you're guilty of something and explain why you've done it. We can all sit there and say we're guilty. Yeah, I did it. Can I go now? You're talking about another five or ten years process of working their way through your rehabilitation and finding out why you committed the crime, why you did what you did. I couldn't explain all that. And I'm a fucking shit liar because I've got a memory span of a goldfish. So there's no point actually sitting there trying to lie to people and say you were guilty just to get out. It doesn't work like that. Uh, I ended up fighting them at own level by say, basically putting myself up front. And I did that by going to uh, Grendon Prison which is a therapeutic community. And I was at Grendon for some two and a half years, sitting on group therapy every single day, and telling people about myself, how I felt, how I thought, why I did what I did on a daily basis, and how I got to be where I was that day. After two and a half years, they decided that they didn't have any issues with me, that I did not represent a risk of reoffending because I didn't display any traits uh, uh, that would lead them to believe that. But at the same time, it was Home Office policy that you must take part in offending behaviour work unless uh, uh, to progress. So basically, he said, "Thanks very much. Two and a half years. <coughs> Great. Fine. No worries. Now go away and do your offending behaviour work." Basically, they were going to send me back into the dispersal system to start all over again. Luckily, I was a discretionary life op, so my case was put up in front of a judge to decide whether I should have parole or not. And the judges decided that I should have parole and that I wasn't a risk to society. I was a fucking screwball, but that didn't make me a danger to society. I was more worried about me being a danger to myself because I was uh, pretty much suicidal most of the time I was in prison. Uh, I was a heavy drug user, I was involved in extremes of violence many, many, many times, both on myself and on other people. I've attacked many people in prison and I will do so again if somebody threatens me in that kind of way, especially in that kind of environment. You're in a prison, where are you going to go? You've got nowhere to go. So you have to do whatever it is you have to do and that's what I did. For pretty much the whole of my prison sentence, I trained. I trained, 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 and trained, and trained. I might look a skinny dying bastard now, but I was chucking heavy weights about. I was going running out marathons for fun. And it was just basically keeping myself ready, forever alert, ready for the next attack, ready for the next day, for 8 o'clock in the morning when your door was unlocked. Because usually in dispersal, if there hasn't been a murder by 9.30 in the morning, it's going to be you know, relatively a quiet day. Because that's when they'll come for you first thing in the morning, while you're still lying tucked up in your warm, cosy bed. Someone will come in and just stab you so many times. You end up, you know, you're dead in bed. You never get out of bed. Or they'll wait for you when you're in the showers. You know, and they'll come in for you then. mob handed mostly. Not many of them come for you on their own. Before I was released, I was sent to an open prison. I was meant to be there for two years to uh, prepare me for release and life on the outside. 
the Home Office argued about it for a year, so eventually I was in a, a, an open prison for probably about 11, 11 months, I think I was actually there. And I have to say, it's actually probably the hardest prison I've ever actually been in, because I was 39 years old, and I was so, so desperate to have my life back. I would have done anything, but I couldn't square away in my own head to conform to anything, to anyone, to what they wanted. And so I struggled daily just to get through every single day to actually obey an order. I hated it, and I, I hated myself for it, because it was the one thing I never ever did. If they told me to turn right, I'd go left. If they said no, I'd say yes, just to be bloody minded, just to piss them off, just to cause a fucking problem. Most of the time, you know, I wouldn't wear a prison uniform. Yes, it was because I didn't consider myself a, pro uh, a prisoner, but as much as anything else, I really liked fucking them off. I really liked wandering around the prison, bollock naked, and going, fuck off, fuck you, and the horse you rode into town on, and come and do whatever it is you're going to do, because you're not going to beat me. There's only one way you're ever going to beat me, and that's to kill me. They came close a few times, but... Uh, was Mancunians are made of stern stuff. <laughs> Since I got out of prison, I was uh, uh, under the authority of the probation service. I was still on life license for two years before I won my appeal. Uh, I pretty much waited until I was on monthly reporting, and then I fucked off down to Cornwall and went to uh, live with one of my mates who had met in jail. He was in jail for growing uh, grown cannabis, and. Uh, had opened a pub up down in Cornwall. So I used to disappear down there and I was working behind the bar with him for two years. Uh, every month I used to go back to Manchester with my rucksack and the probation services, sit there and go, everything all right? Yeah, no worries, bye, go back to Cornwall. They knew I wasn't where I was supposed to be, but you know, what the fuck are they gonna do about it? They got to catch me first. I think going down to Cornwall was actually one of the best things I actually did. It's actually become my sanctuary because I won my case in 2005 and I think by then I was still pretty much as I was in prison. I was still very, very much the prisoner of the convict, wanting to fight anyone and everybody at the drop of a hat. And I was being used as such in the pub game down in Cornwall. Anytime there was a problem, it was me that was going over the bar and knocking people out to deal with it. And it took me some time to actually figure out who I was and what I was about. And what I actually wanted to be. And I think it was some... Maybe four, four or five years, almost even, before I actually realised just how fucked up I really was. And pretty much my world crashed down around me because I realised I, I didn't actually fit in out here. I don't understand your world. I don't understand words like hate. I'm not so sure I understand words like love. I don't really know how to show it. I don't really know how to feel it. I don't know how to re have relationships. I was a virgin until I was 40 years old. You know, all my relationships since I've been out of prison, I've basically tore them to pieces. I'm struggling at the moment so, so much. Uh, I think it's uh, three weeks ago, I, uh, I flipped out. I was in my car, I jumped out of my car, I kicked the doors off, I punched the windows out, and I drove it down a hill into a big pile of colour gas canisters. And there's a big dint like that underneath the bottom of my car next to the fuel tank where I actually landed on top of one of the gas canisters. And I was actually pretty disappointed when it didn't go back <coughs> because I'm so, so tired of living this fucking life. I'm so tired of this shit in my head. But I don't know where to go to deal with it. I don't know who to go to to deal with it. The last time I tried to contact the mental health services, they thought it was a good idea to give me an ex-prison psychologist as my therapist. It was an ex-prison psychologist who used to run a sex offender treatment program in prison. They gave me one of my jailers as my fucking therapist. 
and the first time I spoke to him about anything contentious, he reported me to the police, which terrified me because I didn't know if they were coming for me or not. I ran away from home because I didn't know whether they were going to come crashing through my door that night, the next morning, to come and get me. Because it's the one thing that frightens me the most. Because I will not, I will not let them fucking take me. Not under no fucking circumstances. Because believe you me, having a clear conscience does not allow me to sleep easy in my fucking bed. Because I had a clear conscience in 1978, and it didn't stop me going to fucking prison for 25 years. Having a clear conscience is no guarantee of not going to prison. You don't have to commit a crime. You just have to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Be the wrong person. You might be a little bit screwed up. You might be a little bit of a fuck up. Even more of a fucking target. How many miscarriages of justice cases have you looked at where the people that you're looking at as miscarriages of justice, you're thinking, this guy's like, you know, a couple of cans short of a fucking six pack doesn't make them a danger to society, doesn't make them bad people, it makes them vulnerable. And that's the problem. I was speaking to one person a couple of weeks ago at the, uh, 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 the conference we were at in London. Now he spent quite some time in prison for quite a notorious murder. And I was sitting there chatting to him because I'd, I'd waited many, many years to actually bump into this guy and speak to him. And we were talking and he went, yeah, I, I, I had quite a bad time in prison. One time someone came up and kicked a chair in front of me. And he thought that was really bad. And he's, in his mind it was. In his mind it was. It was threatening, it was frightening. But is that the mentality of the person you're talking about? That was the most frightening thing. And it was to him. You know, I got stabbed fucking three times, twice in the neck. They were trying to kill me. That was fucking frightening. But that was in my world, in his world. But this is a the guy they put down for fucking murder, a notorious murder. This is the kind of people who need the help the most. These are the kind of the people that the justice system is supposed to protect. And it doesn't. It destroys them. As it destroyed me. Not completely. I'm still fucking hanging on. Maybe by my fingertips. But believe you me. If you're all here next year, I'll be here with you. Thank you.